Yeah, that's. Uh, I think if I change the aspect ratio, it's gonna it's gonna mess up. I know it's alright. It's just. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'll um, t I I'll start at uh, twelve, I suppose. All right, so maybe let me start. I'm uh, I'm going to do a bunch of uh, like um, so. I'm going to talk about a little bit of my background, so it's not going to be critical. Um, so if someone join in, uh, it should be fine. Um, all right, so um, I'm going to talk about three D shape uh, analysis mostly, and. Uh, can you see the screen clearly, like without the uh, amount of participants on that stuff? Or is it visible? Yes, yes, it's okay. All right. Um, so, so basically what I'm gonna talk about is uh, 3D shape analysis, but it's not really what I am doing. It's more like um, what I learn about a field that's a little bit parallel to what we are doing in robotics. Um, but so it's it's more like an opportunity to pick up some uh, tools uh, from a different community, and um, I, I'm gonna try to take you into uh, um, a nice introduction to it. Um, but um, so hopefully you learn new things, and I, I did put a lot of pictures, so I, I hope it's gonna be a little bit entertaining. Uh, I hope. Um, so, so just a little bit about me uh, as a as a beginning. So I was born in a in a village of uh, eighty people. Um, so that's uh, that's pretty small. So, so that there's a the town where, where I was living from um, zero to five, and that's where I spent most of my holidays until I turned uh, sixteen, pretty much. Um, so it's a very different lifestyle. Um, yeah. It's it's just a little bit weird, and I don't think many people experience it. But it's it's pretty interesting. Like life is different and much more like chill to some extent. Um, but so then I so I, I was from that area of France. I moved to Paris um, until I turned sixteen, um, where I so basically I was just growing up there. I went to school there went to high school in uh, Lille and then I moved again when I was uh, I was 18 I moved to Lyon uh, to to do my engineering um, studies so it's uh, I did my engineering degree in a, a school called Insalion um, which is set up in uh, old army camp that was situated in the north of uh, north uh, east of Lyon, and the specific city of um, my uni is that we had lots of space because that that was an old um, a old site that uh, was reorganized uh, to host a university 
And uh, so it's very different from what you have in UTS. It's a bit more similar to maybe uh, University of Sydney where you have a proper campus. Um, but because everything was built in the 60s, uh, everything is pretty ugly. So it's not like uh, you see it pretty, but it's like you see it spacious to some extent. Um, so anyway, I did uh, my engineering degree on uh, electrical engineering uh, with a specialization on image processing and uh, signal processing. Um, and so that's, that's where I moved from France to, to Sydney. And so if you can see a pattern in my, in my life, uh, to me, it feels like I've always been going a little bit further at every step away from my home. And uh, I think now for me to go a little bit further would be a bit um, complicated. So I might, I might try a little bit, but I think, I think at some point I'll have to move closer to home. Um, so anyway, um, so when I came to Sydney first, I was working with uh, Alan on the same uh, project that I'm working on now. And so it's like on a like a cow um, shape analysis to some extent, and uh, so we also do it on uh, on lamb and stuff. But um, then I, so that was just an internship at the beginning, and, and then I joined um, to start my PhD with um, with Remy Teresa. Uh, Alan was also part of the team. Uh, uh, and uh, stuff. And then there was um, 40 years students. Um, and that was pretty cool. Um, so I was working on, uh, on this massive tool uh, that in a, in a weird way I've never seen, uh, but I was just working on the, on the data interpretation of it. Um, so basically you, you take this tool and you put it uh, with a crane inside a pipe and it generates uh, an electromagnetic field uh, from a, a coil that's created here. And you have a set of receivers over there. Uh, and then you need to try to... So, so basically the tool goes inside a, and collect data for, I don't know, let's say 30 minutes. And uh, let me know if my connection is unstable because I got a notification saying my connection was, was bad. Um, so, so let me know if my voice is um, weird. Um, so, so anyway, you put that uh, the tool inside the pipe, and um, so once you get it out, uh, you need to predict where there is corrosion and what's happening inside um, inside the pipe. And so that that's uh, that was my PhD. So at the end of my PhD, I did think that um, it was a very specific field uh, and I wanted to change uh, my research focus. So basically I wanted to, to change from uh, data analysis on electromagnetic tools, uh, which uh, the community is very, very tiny and um, and there's not many research opportunity for it. Um, so. So that's where I started to work with Alan. And uh, so my main motivation for it was to work on, um, on 3D perception more than... Um, than uh, so it's still on sensing, uh, but I want to work with 3D images. And it's something that I've done throughout my career. So I was always trying to... Uh, for, for, um, for my PhD, I was sort of involved uh, in, uh, in 3D mapping a little bit and 3D reconstruction of, uh, of pipe, uh, sh uh, like pipe profile that we would use for, for ground truth. And uh, so now what, what I'm doing uh, with Alan, so I, I'm just gonna give you a, a rough idea about what we're, we're doing. So we, we have an annotated template um, that's a blue and red piece, and we morph it into different um, carcasses with uh, stuff like um, uh, embedded deformation, and uh, so it's very similar to what uh, Liang students are doing. And so then we extract consistently um, 
an area of the carcass that we use uh, as a place where we can consistently describe the, the shape of the overall um, carcass. So we, then we feed it into a machine learning process and we estimate um, uh, so meat ratio and fat ratio. So how much fat do you get into the carcass and how much meat uh, do you get? So, so then you can, uh, you can sell it uh, with more information and uh, ultimately you can um, optimize uh, where, you, where you're gonna send it in the world. So for example, some markets might want uh, carcasses with a little bit more fat, and then you can optimize uh, for, for the customer, basically. Um, but that, that's not really what I'm gonna talk about today. So, so what I'm gonna talk about today is purely um, geometry processing. And it's a very good timing because, um, so just, just uh, during the last month, there was a symposium on geometry processing that was happening. And it's, uh, I think it's one of my favorite uh, conference uh, that's out there because it's a, a small community and they just do geometry and 3D uh, manipulation uh, they do a little bit of um, of uh, deep learning, um, but always on, on 3D data. Um, and they have a lot of uh, traditional methods um, for geometry processing. And it's not really, uh, so most of the people that goes to, to this conference also publish in uh, SIGGRAPH, um, but it, it's not. Uh, it's not really the same. Uh, the same community. So this community is just about the manipulation of 3D data, um, which is which is pretty interesting. And um, given that uh, they they just had uh, a conference over the last month, so there's lots of uh, state of the art uh, paper that um, are interesting to me, and I try to put uh, a few of them inside this uh, this presentation. Um, so let's first discuss what uh, a 3D shape. Um, so if you look at on, on the on the left, uh, you have the statue of uh, Lucy. So it's it's a 3D model and um, it it represents uh, it's a 2D surface that represents the shape of a statue, right? So if you look at it, uh, you you can look at it with different uh, density. And it can be just, uh, so, so here it's, you just have the visualization of uh, a set of 3D points that are shown in, uh, in blue. And you have all the triangles that are on the surface. Uh, so, so that's really what a, a 3D shape is. Um, but, so you, you can just represent it like this. So you, you have uh, a set of, um, of vertices that would have n, uh, n by three matrix. So like that would be x, y, z, and you would have n for each of the points uh, that would be represented on the surface. And similarly, you need another matrix of uh, integer, and you would have m of them for your number of triangles and they refer to which triangle is associated. So for example, for it's, uh, so zero, one, two would be the, the uh, vertex number zero, the vertex number one, and the vertex number two, and that form one triangle. Um, so it, it's, it's a very compact representation, but um, the problem is that if I ask you uh, to give, to, to find the neighborhood of a point, um, so let, let's say we go through the point uh, zero and I want all the triangles that are associated to it. Um, and the problem is that in order to find... Uh, Rafael, can I ask you a question here? Sure, sure, sure. Go ahead. Yes, for the, for the triangle, they are not uh, arbitrary, right? Mm. Like, like for example, the previous one, previous page. Yeah. Uh, you can't have a triangle from zero, one, and three, can you? No. Well, it, it depends, but they are basically defined on 
on which one are, are found on, on, the, on the manifold. So it's defined by the manifold, right? Uh, so one property that you would find uh, in many uh, in many libraries to some extent is that they always orientate the order of um, the triangle in the same way. So you would have uh, a rotational, like so 0, 1, 1, 2, 1, 3, 2. And it kind of help you to find the orientation of the normal. So it can tell you uh, which side is inside and which side is outside of the surface. So there is an order specific to it, basically. Um, and if you had a, like, let's say you want to do an edge flip here. So you take all these two triangles and you replace the edge uh, one, two by zero, three. So that's mean that then you would have a triangle zero, one, three and zero, three, two, right? So, it's, um, does it respond to your question? I really want to ask, uh, suppose we have zero, one, two, and uh, one, three, two, then we will not be able to have zero, one, three as another triangle because they are kind of overlapping each other, right? So basically, can we say the triangle can't overlap? Can we say? Um, yeah, so, so what you're describing, uh, mm -hmm would be a non-manifold uh, surface. And okay. what's happening is that um, ideally you wouldn't have it, but mm -hmm. uh, given that specific uh, data structure, sometimes you cannot uh, avoid it with a hard constraint. So it might happen, uh, okay. but that, uh, that's something we want to avoid, yes, indeed. Um, so, so back to, to the one ring neighborhood. So the one ring neighborhood consists of this, uh, for a given point, so V0, um, let's say you have to find all the points that are connected to this point in his, its neighborhood. Um, so through uh, all the faces that are around it. And the problem that uh, if you have just two matrices uh, is that if you want to find uh, just the point that are adjacent to a point, you have to loop through all uh, the faces. So it, it's a little bit, uh, it's a little bit computationally heavy. And what you might want to do instead is to have a more complex data structure where, for example, for each uh, vertex, you have, uh, so, so let's say you, you write it in a, class-oriented uh, approach. And so for each vertex, so for example, for that vertex here, you say uh, the position of the point, x, y, z, but you also add a, a half edge uh, that connected to another point. And then you also, for all the faces, you have the list of um, the vertex that are linked to it. And so you also add one half edge. And so for the, half edge, you would have all these properties. Uh, so which one is the next one? Which one is the previous one? And which one is uh, the opposite half edge that you have? And so what it allows you to do is that you can travel throughout your faces uh, fairly easily. So you can move across your graph um, without having to, to look for uh, to look for, by, for, for example, um, if you want uh, all the all the um, the vertices that are around one point, uh, you can just travel through uh, the half edge and look through all the faces, and you can create a list of points uh, very, very, very quickly. Rafael, can I ask a question? Yeah. So is it half edge edge because it's uh, by directional edge so when you try no, it's unidirectional it's unidirectional so why is it half because it's one and two so you got so uh, if they were bidirectional that would be one edge uh, but because they're directed you have two of them in order to create one full edge does it make sense so you put intermediate 
vertex? I, the, yeah, I, do, I didn't get why it's half. Okay, so, so you, you see that point here, right? Mm -hmm. Where I have my mouse. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the uh, edge go in that direction, right? Yep. So, so the red one. What's happening is that you got another one that go from the black to the white, right? Yeah. And it's, so, so you got- So in the other. different direction? Yes. yes. So it's bi-directional. No, no, so no. The full edge is <laughs> bi-directional and then each half yes. goes in different direction. Yes? yes. Okay, yes. yeah, thanks. But so, so what's happening here is that for, uh, so here what, what you see on, on the figure is not uh, very thick edges. It's narrow ones that are, it's two different objects, basically, that's, that's the thing. Uh, but anyway, like um, most of the time, all these uh, components are embedded inside um, uh, a structure. And so if you consider um, uh, so di different frameworks, so if you look at, uh, for example, uh, Seagal, uh, VCG, Lib, or Geometry Central and, and many others, uh, they do have, um, they, they do have all this stuff uh, hidden from the user. Uh, so meaning that you, you cannot access uh, it direct, like the implementation, you don't have access to it, uh, but you can use it as a tool. So, so that's the idea behind it. Uh, where, for example, if you look at uh, libraries that have a simple data structure like libigl or gp toolbox, um, so one is in C++, the other one is in MATLAB. They are written by the same, per um, the same person. The, the difference is that all your data are just um, like two dimensional matrices and there is no classes. Uh, so that, that's the main difference. And what you lose by having a simpler data structure, you need to earn it by having um, smarter algorithm so your your implementation would would be um, would have to be smarter to avoid multiple iteration through your data um, so in terms of com complex uh, libraries um, Seagal is kind of uh, a very old library that uh, predates uh, git and uh, they they have a lot of implementation that are the state of the art uh, but it's a bit complicated to get into it. Uh, if you look at VCG lib, it's a library that's uh, in the backend of um, MeshLab, if you've used it. And uh, it's really good, but there is no documentation, well, no proper documentation that's available. And uh, if you look at Geometry Central, it's, um, it's a much newer library. Uh, but that has a lot of cool, um, cool tools that are not necessarily available uh, in other libraries, but um, they don't have everything. So because it's sort of like the, the new cool kid in the game, uh, they have some, some cool stuff, but it's not complete. All right. Uh, so, so from there, now uh, let's talk about uh, Curvature. So Curvature is... Um, is something that allows you to analyze um, the 3D shape of, uh, like a, a 3D shape, basically. So what I'm saying by, by this is that um, the curvature is as important as um, the discretization of your shape in the sense that it's what form. Um, so if you have a 3D shape, you can just uh, decompose it into local curvature and um, it's very useful for lots of algorithm. And for us, for example, when we are looking at it from a carcass perspective, it's, uh, it's something that we, we can just take raw curvature uh, and throw it into a machine learning algorithm to predict fat and uh, muscle. And it's sort of work. It's not great, but it, it does work. So you can use it, uh, consider it as a, as a very basic uh, measuring uh, measure uh, that allow you to do a lot of cool stuff after. So the definition of the mean curvature is basically for one point, 
the integration around that point of uh, the local curvature. And so then you just, uh, so what, what's happening, you, you pick a small delta uh, theta, you look at the curvature around that direction uh, on the plane, and you do the integration uh, from zero to two pi, and then you just normalize by one over two pi. So it's, uh, it's a very simple uh, formulation. Uh, all right, so, so now something, early, so the problem with that is um, when you're on a 2D surface, uh, the local curvature on the plane is not necessarily uh, very well defined. Uh, so what I mean is that if you look at a delta theta around the point, uh, so let me go back at that, uh, that slide. So let's say you have this point and then you have a small angle here. Uh, it's a flat triangle, right? So there is no curvature. So it doesn't mean much. Um, so what people came up with is um, uh, an operator uh, that's called the Laplace Beltrami operator um, that allow you to do a bunch of stuff. And so basically it's taking the problem of curvature into a linear algebra problem. And so you get uh, in, um, in 3D graphics uh, or in 3D geometry processing, they, they used to call it the Swiss army knife of 3D geometry. And uh, that, that's why you get a small ablation over here. Um, and uh, so, so basically the relation with the uh, mean curvature is just like two times the mean curvature and uh, you multiply it by the direction of the normal. Um, but uh, it, it's, it's, you can just look at it as a, a 2D tool uh, that gives you access to the mean curvature over all the surface. So I'm just gonna go through uh, the definition of it. And uh, if you've seen my talk on skeletonization, it's gonna be the same uh, because the definition didn't change. Uh, but if you don't understand uh, this part, you can just consider it as uh, two matrices uh, that uh, embed information about the curvature. Um, so the definition of it is that for each point, um, you add up the, so, so you do an integration uh, over all your edges around the point and you add uh, the opposite cotangents angles. And uh, so, so what's happening is that technically on the diagonal, you sum up this point and on all the other points, uh, in, a, in a square matrix, square spa, sparse matrix of size uh, that has the size of your vertices square, basically. Um, and then on all the points that are IG, you put this one with a minus sign. And for II, you add this one and, and you do it for all edges, basically, right? So that's pretty much uh, the code you would want to run um, if you wanted to compute it. So as I said before, it's very common that you need your one ring neighborhood. Um, so that, that's one example of it. Um, so that's called the cotangent uh, matrix. And in the rest of the presentation, I, I will uh, use a notation L for it, right? The other one that uh, we need is, um, no, I removed that. Uh, so it's um, a matrix that gives you the size of. Um, um, so what, what the weight that you should give to each point? Uh, so basically, you take uh, the, the centroid of each triangle, and you compute this area that is in blue. And basically, what's happening is that um, if you if you have met, uh, two meshes with different um, discretization to some extent, uh, you want them to have different weights um, in the sense that like here, um, like 
here that, that point should have more importance than this this one because it cover a larger area and especially if you have areas that are not discretized uh, continuously uh, this is very important um, all right so let me just check the time oh, okay so I, I need to go a little bit faster um, so the cool thing about this tool um, so, so now uh, if you don't understand how it's computed, just consider it as uh, two matrices that embed uh, the Laplacian operator. So the Laplacian is a curvature, and another uh, uh, another interpretation of it is that it corresponds to the second derivative of your surface. And uh, it, it so if you want the explanation of why it's compu computed like this. Uh, you can read this book, uh, this paper that uh, go through all the mathematical uh, explanation about it. But really, it's you should just look at it as a tool um, that you can use to manipulate your curvature on the surface. So, if I, if I just very quick question: this yeah. is for, this is done for each vertex? Mm. Yes, 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 yes. So. Um, but basically what I was saying, for example, before, uh, so when you have the one ring neighborhood, uh, what they do in uh, libagl because they don't want to have this complexity, what they do is like, uh, they just remove uh, J out of the equation and they just populate dynamically all, all your matrices. So technically you can find the same uh, efficiency as uh, if, so if you use any library, they would most of the time provide this operator and uh, it's, it's not something very complicated. So you, you can just have access to it, it's quick to compute and uh, it's fairly efficient. Uh, so one in interesting bit is that, uh, so you, for example, you have this matrix, you can use it for mesh smoothing. Uh, so what I'm saying is that you can look at it as, uh, you want to reduce uh, the overall, um, so to reduce the quantity of um, of curvature you have on your mesh, and so uh, if you look at uh, that um, that mesh on this one, you can just look at it as like one has a lower curvature than the other one, and uh, so. It, the interesting bit is that it can be solved very, very, very simply. So it's the same as what I presented in my last presentation. Um, but basically what you do is like, you take the Laplacian here. Here you put a weight for each value. So that's a diagonal matrix um, that has a weight for the Laplacian. Here you, you put um, a set of weights. Uh, so it's a diagonal matrix again that uh, say how much uh, consistency, how much contraction sort of you want. Uh, and so you just solve for uh, the prime. So this means that you just need to invert that matrix, multiply it by this one, and that gives you uh, from this one to that one, right? And, uh, so some people looked at it and they were like, oh, that's, that's a little bit annoying that you have this uh, phenomenon. And so it has been proved that you can have a smoother uh, contraction uh, that mainly would converge toward a sphere uh, if you reformulate the Laplacian. So if you use a different definition of the Laplacian that I, uh, sorry. Don't know what's happening. Ah. Okay. So give, give me a second, I think. Yeah. Four point is not happening, sorry. Um. All right, uh, so, so I'm just gonna go through it quickly here. Uh, so if you have a different definition of the Laplacian that I showed before, 
uh, and, and you solve the same equation, you can end up with uh, that sort of smoother transformation. Um, all right, so give it a minute. Uh, yep, all right. Um, but it's also something uh, we can use. Uh, so I used it for mesh skeletonization. So let's say if you want to be able to manipulate your mesh easily, and uh, you can have um, a set of points where like you, you have the nice property that, um, so the one that they tried to avoid, you can also use it for mesh skeletonization. Um, so another another application you can find is um, let's say you want to compute the distance between one point and, for example, um, the ear of your bunny, right? But you don't want the Euclidean distance; you want the distance following the manifold, right? So uh, typically in um, in robotics, we would consider uh, graph approaches and we would solve this problem with uh, Dijkstra or A star. Um, but the problem with this algorithm is that uh, the distance does not go through the triangles. So you just go through the edges of the triangles. Um, but what's happening is that um, you can actually solve this problem by considering it as um, the heat propagation through the surface. And so it, it has been shown that uh, if you compute, uh, let's say I put a hot needle on the surface at uh, that very specific point, um, you, you can, and, and I give you the temperature over a specific amount of time, you can compute the distance on the geodesic uh, between x here and here, that would be y, um, by using this equation. And like, then the problem is how do you get the temperature over the surface? And the nice part about it is that if you get the same equation as what I gave before, so you have the weight matrix and you have your time here, then here you have your cotangent matrix and you just put a Dirac of, uh, value at the vertex where you have, um, you have your, your source of temperature. And just by solving this with um, pseudo inverse, so for example, in MATLAB, uh, that would give you a value of the temperature over the, the surface. And so then you can have access to the geodesic. Well, yeah. Just very quickly. this. Um, you're presenting this, and I'm not uh, as familiar as, as uh, on this stuff itself. But the the fast marching methods seem to be exactly what they are doing in this regard, right? Are you familiar with that? Basically, uh, they calculate the geodesic distance uh, on on the surface of the on the surface itself. So I'm, yeah, ju I'm just yeah, I just yeah. make a comment because you meant you compare with a star or something like that. But I think the the FMM methods are exactly doing what you're describing here. Yeah, so the, the only difference is that this is faster. Okay. Um, and one, one uh, downside of it is that it is an approximation. Uh, however, in the paper that you have here, uh, they gave the, the update for the exact distance. Um, but yeah, yeah, you're right. It's just a more efficient approach uh, for the same problem. Yes. Thanks. And uh, so if you look at the paper that is written at the bottom, um, you, you need some additional operator like the gradient and, um, and the divergent uh, for, for your surface. But this is basically the same, um, the same as um, what, what Jaime uh, mentioned. Basically. Wait, just give me a second. All right, so in terms of other application that you can find, uh, I'm not, I'm going to talk about, sorry. I'm going to talk about spectral analysis. Um, so let's say, 
let's say you take your Laplacian and you solve the Hagen function decomposition. Uh, so what I'm saying is that you're looking for the linear values that allow you to, uh, to solve this equation. So basically uh, what's happening is that you're looking for the matrix of size uh, n by m. So, so sorry here, like uh, uh, I didn't organize my slide properly, um, but m here is the number of eigenvalues that you want. Um, and uh, so where before it was a number of triangles. So, so now it's like uh, your eigen functions and the number of eigenvalues, you would want n, m of them. And so that's the uh, eigenvalues is just a, a linear uh, vector. And your eigen function would have the size of your uh, vertices multiplied by your number of uh, eigenvalues, basically. So how many do you want? And so um, basically what's happening is that uh, you can just solve this in MATLAB and uh, it gives you um, your spectral information about uh, your Laplacian. So at this point, I was thinking I, I should just talk my, just call my talk the Hagen function decomposition of Laplacian, Laplace Beltrami operator, uh, just to sound a bit smart and <laughs> it's a bit scary. Uh, but what it, it actually means, uh, it, it's actually very simple. So, so it sounds very complicated, but what's actually happening is that, uh, for example, if you use uh, lib ij, so you can use one very simple function just to have v on f, which gives you two metrics. Um, then you can use um, just, uh, you call that function that gives you your cotangent matrix. Uh, you call that function that gives you your mass matrix. And then in uh, MATLAB, uh, you can just uh, call a solver uh, that's called eggs real that give you your eigenvalues on your eigenvector. And what's eggs real? So that's, that's just a MATLAB function. What it does is just uh, solving this uh, equation. So finding the eigen function and the eigenvalues that satisfy this condition basically. Um, so it sounds very complicated, but in practice it's, it's fairly simple. Um, so, sorry, who, who wanted to talk? I'm not sure. Was it uh, Teresa? All right, okay, it doesn't matter. Oh. Okay, sorry. <laughs> um, so, what, what does this Eigen function mean? Um, so if you look at uh, the projection of the Eigen function, you can sort of compare it to spectral decomposition of a shape. So if you're familiar with uh, Fourier analysis, uh, that would be a very similar uh, approach. So if you project the Hagen function over your surface, uh, for example, like the second, so the first Hagen function is, is often, uh, does not often carry much information uh, because it's related to the scale of, of the object. But, um, so the second Hagen function would give you uh, the main direction of your object. And then you start to have um, like sort of frequencies that are a bit more interesting and that carry more and more and more details. And so the, the, uh, the higher the Hagen uh, values on Hagen function, the more um, like low frequency uh, sorry, high frequencies they would be. So you order them by order of frequencies. Um, so what's interesting, so what I do here is that I project the Hagen function onto the shape. Uh, but what if you project uh, geometry onto the Hagen function, like as an alternative? What, 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 what would happen? So ju just as a, a, an argument uh, of ju just trying something, you know? Um, and so that's what was discussed in, uh, in that paper at the bottom. And the interesting bit is that if you project, uh, so you project your geometry, so X, X, Y, and Z onto your um, Hagen functions that give you uh, a set of coefficients. 
So basically what you would have is like three coefficients uh, for your number of eigenfunctions. So it's, uh, that's like one vector uh, that has a size m and you got another one and then you got another one. And what's interesting is that you can recreate your shape if you do it in the other direction again. And so let's say now you just pick k of them. So for example, here you have uh, k equal five, k equal 10, uh, 50, and 150. And so you can see that uh, the more you add eigenfunctions, uh, the more you, you recreate something that's close to your original shape. And so what's interesting about this is that it gives you a compact base uh, to represent any functions. Um, so let's say, for example, I want to quantify curvatures and I want to project them onto uh, my frequencies. Uh, then I can have a set of coefficients that would be a compression over my curvature over my shape. And the cool thing about it is that it does not depend of your number of uh, points that you have in your geometry at the beginning. Uh, so what I'm saying is that if you have 5,000 points or 1 million points, uh, you can end up with something uh, that has a description of your curvature, for example, uh, with the same, uh, the same compactness. Uh, so so that, that's very interesting. Raphael, can I ask you a question? Yeah, go so ahead. Intu intuitively in the previous slide, if you have, um, yeah. I mean, I can see that the final shape is still not quite the cow that you have originally. This so one, yeah. Yeah, if you, the one on the right, yes. So that's yeah. 150. So I can understand this concept of obviously making it more, more compact, but how many do you need? How many Aiken functions do you need to really reconstruct the original so, shape? How much yeah. gain do you really get? Yeah. So, so it depends on the complexity of your shape. So um, the more complex your shape is, and so for example here, uh, the typical thing is um, your uh, legs are very complex because in terms of uh, frequency, so having, um, having a frequency that describe a, a leg uh, is, is hard. Um, it, it's the same as Fourier analysis. You know, if you, if you have a very, a very uh, sharp difference with uh, the, the rest of your signal, it's hard to model where if everything is close to a sigmoid, uh, sorry, a sinusoid, then it's very easy to model, right? So your number of eigenfunction that you would want to use would be proportional to the complexity of the, the shape that you're looking at. Um, yeah, got it, thanks. So, so for example, here, uh, I think I was using uh, 150. And you, you can have a fairly good rep, uh, reconstruction of the armadillo. Um, one interesting bit uh, that I didn't mention before is that if you, if you don't use uh, the mass matrix, you get this kind of very weird, very uh, wavy shapes um, that are not proper. And so, uh, the proper Laplacian would be, the proper formulation of the Laplacian would be L multiplied by M minus one. So like the inverted uh, M. So some uh, Laplacian have this property and I'll talk about one that does. And so you just get a single matrix instead to have two. Uh, but having two of them allow you to, to split um, to split information in two parts, and sometimes it's, it's, it's a little bit useful. Um, so another thing that's a little bit interesting is that, for example, if you have, um, if you want to just change uh, one of the parameters that you, that you had here while doing the reconstruction, um, so let's say, for example, here, I just multiply it by two on this parameter, and what's happening is that I just uh, increase the, the spreading of the leg of the armadillo and by just changing this parameter. So 
it's interesting in the sense that you can do uh, some spectral editing um, by just changing these parameters. And so that, that was what mentioned in, uh, in the paper that you have at the bottom, uh, in the sense that, let's say, you do a spectral decomposition for one shape, and you do the spectral decomposition for another one. So here you have the armadillo, and you have a model of Homer. Uh, what you can do is, like, basically, you can do um, a pose alignment in the spectral domain by using the, um, the low frequency of the armadillo. Uh, but so, so the Eigen function are from Homer for both of them, uh, but you use a coefficient from another one. So here, uh, alpha come from the armadillo and beta come from Homer. And by just doing the reconstruction in this way, uh, you can do pose alignment. Um, so it sounds amazing. And, and like, I was really impressed when I read this. And I was wondering why not more people were using it. Uh, so I gave it a try. And uh, that, that's what I got, basically. So uh, yeah, like the Y is uh, chopped by the image. But. Uh, so I took a cow and a bull, and I tried to to do exactly what you have here. Uh, so you you have uh, the cow here, the bull here, and what, what you actually get is that. Um, so <clears throat> it's not very very bad in the sense that it still keep uh, the details from the bull, but it's obviously not uh, what you expect. Um, so it's, it's a little bit, uh, disappointing. And Raphael, Raphael, I mean, yeah. wouldn't you agree that these two shapes are in terms of frequency, they seem to be quite similar, right? So the low frequency and the high frequencies appear to be yeah. fairly similar. So I don't know whether that, that might be a reason why they really don't exploit that the example that you gave with the Amadillo and, and Homer. Mm. So what do you mean? They look very similar, both of them, in, in yes. terms of frequency. Yes. So therefore, there's not there's not much to exploit because they start already with a very initial, a very initial condition. Whereas in Homer, I can easily see how you can adjust the two together. Uh, so, in, in how you say? Uh, um, I understand what you're saying, but basically, what's happening here uh, is that uh, if anything, that would be a harder problem for Homer and Armadillo. Um, in the sense that, um, like what, what I have with my cow on my bull, uh, because it's a simpler problem, as you say, that's uh, in the sense that they, they are likely to have the same eigen functions, uh, they should be easier to transform, if anything. Um, so, so yes, uh, and uh, essentially it's true, but totally it should just be in my, uh, play in my advantage. Um, Can I ask a very, very silly question? Yeah. Do you have the code for it and you've tried with the, so that the example that you've given before with the Armadillo and yeah. Homer is, is your own result, right? So you know that the algorithm is fine, right? No, no, no. So that, that's, ah. that's uh, picked from the paper. So I basically tried to reproduce uh, the paper. Mm. So that's, uh, <clears throat> so that, that's from the paper. Got you, got you. Uh, I, I, want, I wonder whether you can get hold of those shapes and actually uh, try to see, make sure that you can reproduce at the very least, because in papers, normally they, they always show you the, the nice stuff, but uh, yeah, yeah, in the sure. detail. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's right. <laughs> that's right. Sure. Uh, so, so I actually did. And uh, so, so let me explain you what, what, what's happening, uh, basically. Uh, so if you read the paper, they, they have this sentence uh, that's, that's written uh, so I just have the code here. Uh, so they say this method works provided that the Eigen function that corresponds to the lower frequencies match. In other words, provided that alphas and the beta are expressed in the same language. Um, so the first time I read it, I didn't think much about it. And I, I was a little bit confused and I didn't really understood um, what it meant. Um, but so then I tried it and uh, it didn't work. And then I looked at the 
eigen functions. And uh, so from, from uh, like uh, the two first rows are from the bull, the two second, uh, two last rows are from the cow. And you can say that they are not the same, right? So what, what you were saying in the sense that uh, they should have the same frequency because they look similar uh, is actually not true. Um, but s some are, so if you look at this one and that one, uh, they are the same. And what, what you can actually find is that, uh, for example, the number seven and the number eight here are just the inverse of each other. And so like the three and four are the same, the 10 are the same. And so basically you can find that some of them are roughly match and it's just a sign uh, swap. Uh, but the problem is that uh, they're not organized similarly. And uh, so I, I suppose that's what they meant uh, when they were saying they, they need to be expressed in the same language. Uh, so for example, if, uh, so, so that's what I actually did. Uh, I looked at um, what the Egan functions were and I just mapped them to, to be uh, from, from one to the other. And doing so, I could um, I, I could uh, reproduce uh, that result basically. Um, but so, so so that's about spectral editing. But um, basically, what you want to do is to so when when you are actually looking manually through each shape. Uh, there is a question if you could actually optimize uh, the, the problem of uh, finding these correspondences. So basically solving this puzzle of like uh, that eigen function should be matched to this one, this one should be matched to this one, and this one should be the inverse of that one. And so there is a, a problem in, um, in computer graphics uh, where they do solve this exact uh, specific problem. So Basically, what they do is that um, instead of solving the problem of point correspondences in um, in the um, like on the surface, so let's say you want to match uh, the right leg of a cat with the right leg of a dog, and uh, you want to have this uh, this map of points that are matched between each other. Uh, what they do is they do exactly what I try to do manually. Uh, in the spectral domain. So they try to say, uh, okay, so the, this uh, eigen function should be matched to that one. And uh, so they, they do uh, exactly this problem. And the interesting bit is that here, they use the exact word translate, um, which, which in a weird way uh, does, um, uh, correspond to what uh, they were saying in the previous uh, paper where they were saying they need to speak the same language. Um, so, so I found it pretty interesting and to some extent um, what's happening here is that uh, the matrix, so C is a matrix that map uh, the set of correspondence between uh, the Hagen function of the cat and the eigen function of the dog. And so what's actually happening is that they have, um, they have this uh, map that say, okay, so the first eigen function is the same. Uh, the second one is just uh, inverted. Uh, three, four, five, six are the same. That one is the opposite. And here, because you're looking at the same, uh, the same animal, uh, so you have a, isomorph uh, transformation between both of them. Uh, that, that's why um, the correspondence is very diagonal. Um, so basically you can try to map uh, the opposite. Uh, and so let's say, for example, you do a tail to uh, two ears, and then you do uh, the mapping to the opposite. Well, then you can see that uh, the correspondence is, is complete, uh, completely uh, sort of like messed up in the sense that 
the transformation is much much more complex. Um, so I'm not I'm not going to talk much about this because uh, I could I could go for hours on this, but there is a 60 page uh, introduction of it from SIGGRAPH. Uh, but what I just linked to is a foundational paper but it did open a whole field of research where they tried to do shape correspondence in uh, the spectral domain. Um, so I've been talking about the Hagen functions. So everything I talked about for, for, for the moment is Hagen functions. Uh, but what about Hagen values? Um, and so there is a paper called Shape DNA uh, that takes the Hagen values and what they do is uh, they, they just plot it on a, so they do 2D PCA and plot it on a 2D plot. And they did show that, um, sorry, they did show that you have these clusters of points given a specific uh, geometry. And you can do object classification just from the eigenvalues of its uh, Laplace operator. Um, and that, that, that's very interesting because that also mean that you have this uh, compact representation of an object uh, that's uh, defined in the eigenvalues. Um, so we tried to apply uh, this to our, uh, to our carcass problem by thinking that maybe the shape DNA could be used as a descriptor and you could just estimate uh, how much fat and how much muscle you would have in a, in a carcass by just looking at its eigenvalues. Uh, and so what we found is that um, it does not really work uh, because the eigenvalues are uh, very correlated to each other because we just have carcasses that have the same shape, uh, which makes it a very good uh, descriptor for a classifier. So if you want to recognize carcasses, it's, very, it's a very good descriptor, uh, but it does not necessarily, um, it's not necessarily good for describing an object. Uh, and the reason being that ultimately your eigen function will be the same. Um, so you, your frequencies of your object uh, would be the same but this does not tell you the amplitude of them. Um, so that, that was uh, one, one of the problem that we had. Um, so, so basically at, the, at that point, uh, I went through a bunch of applications that are very easy to solve, uh, where you can just do a very little bit of linear algebra uh, from the Laplacian. Um, so, if you look at uh, the, sorry, I'm just gonna go through it very quickly. Uh, so if you compute the Laplacian, uh, if you want to do mesh smoothing, that's really simple. So you just have to invert uh, that matrix and that's very easy. If you want to compute a geodesic distance, uh, it's very, very, very straightforward in MATLAB. It takes you one line of code. Uh, if you want to compute the, uh, for example, the shape DNA for a descriptor of a shape, uh, it, it's, it's the same. It will take you maybe four line of code. Um, if you want to do spectral analysis, it's a little bit more complicated, but uh, it's still very basic linear algebra operation. Um, and so you can also use it for many of the application that uh, include shape deformation and uh, other application that I didn't have time to find the time for, but there is a whole field of literature about how you can use uh, the Laplacian operator to solve a set of problems uh, in geometry processing. And what, what is interesting about it is that it, it is often a closed form solution for a complicated problem. And uh, so it is pretty nice, but so one might ask, uh, are all these methods still relevant? Uh, are, are, are people still working on this kind of problem? Um, and actually, yes. So if you look at uh, the symposium on geometry processing from last month, 
uh, they had a new formulation of the Laplacian. And what's pretty cool is that when someone come up with uh, a formulation of the Laplacian that's a little bit more powerful, uh, so for example, here they can handle non-manifold meshes. Um, so if you have a shape that's defined like this, uh, where it's not a closed uh, mesh, they have a formulation where they can uh, apply the Laplacian and uh, compute a stable Laplacian for, for this uh, sort of shapes. And it's also applied for point clouds, meaning that all the algorithm I discussed before, you can apply it for a point cloud too. And you can also apply it with this tool um, on, uh, on non-perfect meshes. Uh, so, and that, that's from uh, Geometry Central, uh, like the library I talked about before. Um, but so that, that, that's cool. So that means it's still an active field of research. Uh, but so is it still relevant? Is it, is it still something that's happening? And so obviously what I'm saying is that in the day where like deep learning is sort of taking over a lot of what we are doing, is it, is it what uh, is going to be the future of geometry processing? And one, uh, one take on it is that uh, you can take all this uh, spectral analysis and use it as an input for a deep learning uh, framework. And so that's, that's what some people did. Um, so for example, they solved the shape correspondence problem that I mentioned before. And they use a uh, Eigen function as a sparse compact, uh, sorry, not sparse, but compact representation. And they solved the functional problem with a deep learning approach. Um, but so uh, I have to acknowledge that this is, uh, so what, what actually happened, I was looking at the number of citation of this paper and I think that, uh, so it's from 2017 on, and they got something like 80 uh, citations. So it's not something that is a game changer in, in the field. Um, but so what's, what's happening with deep learning in, uh, in 3D data? And so in, uh, in 2D images, um, a consensus has been uh, reached where everyone uh, agreed that CNN architecture uh, for dealing with um, 2D images is a way to go. And so one of the main reason is because there is a very well-defined representation uh, in the sense that uh, you have um, a dense 2D grid uh, with images. And I, I think to some extent, if you look at, uh, um, if you want to apply deep learning architectures to um, event-based camera, you would have the same problem where you need to have a change of paradigm um, because of the sparsity of the data. And so that's pretty much what's happening on 3D data. So you have uh, sparse data and uh, many different representation possible, uh, meaning that uh, you can have point clouds, surface meshes, uh, so voxel, uh, voxel data. You can have one 3D shape that's defined by multiple, uh, multiple images. So what they do is like, you, you take many pictures of the rabbit and you consider it as your 3D uh, data representation. And you can have um, same distance field uh, that's defined the distance uh, with respect to your surface. And so given that you have all these different uh, inputs, it's not necessarily clear how you, how, what, what is the way to go for, for deep learning? Um, and obviously, like, the first thing that has been tried was to do 3D CNNs. Um, so that has been tried in 2015. And what they do is like 3D convolution. Um, and they just uh, consider, uh, so I, I, for example, point cloud or voxels or sign distance field. Uh, 
and uh, you make it into a cube and then you apply your three convolution onto it. Um, so one of the problem with it is that lots of information is equal to zero. So for example, if you, if you look at an occupancy grid, uh, the area where you actually have information is pretty small uh, and they just happen on the boundary of your surface. Um, so what's happening is that the, let, let's say you have a cube of um, n by n by n. Um, so, 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 so uh, yeah, so, yeah, so you have a cube of n by n by n, so n cube. Um, like, that would be uh, the, the dimension of your data that you're dealing with, uh, with a voxel grid. But actually what's happening is that um, the surface representation is square while the space is 3D. So you have one more dimension that goes wasted and so it's, it's not very interesting to, to go towards this approach. Um, so that said, uh, I think the, the paper on VoxNet has thousands of citations, um, so several thousands. Um, an alternative is to go uh, just with point clouds. So you just consider point clouds and you put your point cloud as an input uh, of n by three, so ju just as before. Uh, and you use this as, um, you use it to fit it into a, a neural network. So here you have a bunch of layers with multi-layer perceptron. Um, so they have this iterative thing where they, they go through it. Uh, not too sure of what the feature transform is about, but uh, basically you got a set of multi-layer perception on, at the end. Uh, you can either fit it into a normal neural network and predict. Uh, so if you want to do classification or part segmentation, you can just uh, solve it like this. So it's basically a giant um, classic neural network architecture to some extent. Um, so when, when they started it, um, they did improve it by adding hierarchical uh, connectivity with the neighbors. Um, so let, let's say you consider the same approach as before, uh, but on top of it, you consider, uh, you add a, a K neighbors uh, connectivity uh, to to what you had around you. So you have this thing where like your points are like uh, connected to each other and then uh, you have some discretization and then so you would have this hierarchical uh, structure that built uh, from layers to layers and then you just feed it into a normal neural network and that's sort of like uh, what's happening in the convolution in the 2D space where your convolution uh, define relationship with neighbors. And so that, that's pretty similar to what's happening here. Uh, so now, uh, if you look at uh, meshes, there was sort of the same approach uh, that was happening. So instead of doing a voxel grid where like you, you just do a 3D uh, CNN, uh, people are doing 2D convolution over um, a kernel that's defined on the manifold. Uh, so they have this anisotropic uh, CNNs that uh, bend on the surface, sort of, and they do their convolution like this, and then you feed it into a normal uh, CNN. But just that your convolution is defined on the, on the surface. And I think that's probably the most pr promising uh, approach um, for deep learning. But because there is no consensus yet, uh, what may happen is that uh, just for simplicity's sake, people are going to go back to uh, 3D convolution and they won't care about it. Uh, um, well, the, the bottom line is that uh, not everyone agree on how to use it. Um, but, um, but, there is a, a clear shift that has been happening over the, uh, the last years uh, where if you, <clears throat> sorry, if you look at the Google Scholar of some of the academic in the field, uh, 
Um, many of them that used to do classical geometry uh, uh, have now shifted towards deep learning. So not everyone, um, but uh, all of them are at least exploring it a little bit. Um, so, so there is this shift that's happening too. Uh, one, of, one of the articles that uh, came out of MIT, uh, I think it was like a few weeks ago, um, they discussed on how, um, what, what is the cost of deep learning in terms of uh, environmental cost and economical cost. And um, what they are saying is that um, scaling deep learning in the way we used to uh, over the last few years is not sustainable. And uh, we cannot, uh, either from an environmental cost or from an economical cost, uh, it's not viable. It's not something that we can afford. And while uh, lots, lots of uh, push have been done uh, by very big companies, uh, such as Google and, and uh, Twitter and um, Facebook, for example, uh, to, to just name a few, um, if you have to train a neural network and pay, cost you $100,000, um, yeah, the, um, the future of deep learning and uh, the, the exponential of the scaling of, uh, with respect to data is questionable. So I think in the future, things will change. And all these problems are particularly relevant in, uh, in 3D geometry processing. Um, because um, you have this extra dimension that make it even more computationally heavy. Um, so we are not we are not too sure of what's going to happen. Um, but yeah, that, that, that's uh, that, that's about it for my talk. And uh, I hope I gave you a bit of an overview of uh, classical uh, geometry processing, uh, but also on what has been happening over the last uh, last few years uh, with deep learning. And I'd like to invite the other um, academic to some extent um, to give their opinion about how they see things evolving. Like, do they think that uh, um, everything is gonna shift in the same way as 2D processing has shifted towards deep learning or, and to some extent it's applied to SLAM and uh, 3D SLAM and all these problems and 3D reconstruction on. Uh, so yeah, like if any academic has uh, an opinion about how, wh what is the future? How, how are things going to evolve? Uh, yeah, I invite you uh, now to share your opinion about it. <laughs> Yes, I don't hear. Uh, I don't really do much on deep learning myself, and even my group haven't done much. Uh, my current understanding is deep learning is suitable for some some task like a object detection, yes. loop closer, yeah. loop closer detection, those kind of things. But it's still probably not suitable for SLAM as a whole. That's my current feeling. Uh, I'm curious about this uh, last slide you have about deep learning. They are saying computation limits of deep learning. This is deep learning in general or for some special kind of problems? Uh, so here they are like mostly looking at uh, CNNs, but it's, it is for deep learning in general. So it, it's all depend on uh, the complexity of the task, obviously. And uh, the more complex the task is, uh, the more parameter you would need in your framework to some extent and um, the more it would cost to train to some extent. And it, it also goes with the amount of data you have, I suppose. Uh, Teresa here. <laughs> yeah. in, in my view, deep learning has many advantages. I, we, we've seen, I don't know, very good results, especially in computer vision. Uh, I think the the future is using deep learning where it makes sense. 
and combining with estimation algorithms that we typically use in in robotics or in probabilistic robotics. Um, so I think that the future is in the combination of both, uh, which could be in a nice framework combined end to end. So I, I had the same opinion at some point, and uh, and the more I look at how how people are using deep learning framework, uh, the more I consider that uh, it's not combination of both, but rather, so I, I, I would say, I, I used to think that uh, a nice way to combine things would be, uh, so you, you have a, a nice framework where, for example, let, let's say Islam, right? Um, so you, you try to uh, take some, some block uh, some modules of your slam and you get it so uh, get it solved by deep learning right and then uh, you take outputs of uh, like image segmentation or whatever uh, and then you fit it into your slam framework and so you still have your optimization in the background um, so that that's how i i used to think uh thing would happen for i i, I say i will say it's the other way well from my view it's it will be the other way around where our <laughs> standard estimation frameworks get embedded in a in a back propagation framework for deep learning exactly exactly so it's a, it's where the constraint we put the constraints of our models and, yeah. and most of our models are nonlinear functions that can be um, uh, uh, differentiated so they can fit perfectly nice in on a very nice way the back propagation algorithm so I, I think it's it's the way we are probably gonna be going, and and it's already happening. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I I think the same actually. I think it's about getting uh, fully connected, uh, well, fully end-to-end -end framework in order to to behave. And so you, the the way I see it is like you define architectures where you force uh the shape of the network to follow um a similar thing so for example like you know you, you force uh, some graph optimization inside the inside the, the deep learning architecture I, I, i'm just um talking nonsense but uh like the, the idea is there like so in terms of theory it doesn't make sense but the idea of forcing the architecture of your of your deep learning framework in order to mimic uh, what we are doing, but fully end-to-end -end and fully uh, backpropagated, I agree. Yeah, but I, I'm sorry, I, I just noticed that I I, I uh, overshoot the time that was allocated for me. Um, so if there is any question, uh, feel free to ask it, and otherwise we're gonna we're gonna stop the session. I just want to make a very, very last remark because you have this slide on the, on the, yeah. on the, on the face. Actually, I think the presentation was excellent, Rafael. Very good, and I really learned a lot on the first part in particular. And um, I just, I just noticed here the errors, right? The error rates that we actually have there, which obviously we're talking about state of the art, and some yeah. of them error rates are still, you know, in the orders of five, ten, twenty percent, whatever it is. So even throwing all these computations in the current framework of deep learning, it's still left at that stage right so it's it's, it's a it's, yeah i agree with you it's, it's certainly some food for thought because obviously the current the current principles are throw more at it <laughs> whatever environmental or economic cost that be that may be that you know big companies don't care about it but i think it's a very interesting point to realize that still fairly large errors in the scheme of things uh, when you look at it so yeah, so like the, the large one are about uh, the, the current state of the art uh, mm. that we have now. So on ImageNet, for example, they're saying 11%. Um, but obviously, it it's really depends on how you evaluate it. <clears throat> but well, but the, yeah, the, yeah. No, uh, the, the benchmark is there to be evaluated, so at least you can follow that always very explicit. But I think the more interesting bit for me is the fact that Yes, we, we need those benchmarks. Obviously, ImageNet it is evaluated against some benchmarks, but whether how that how those yes. benchmarks really yeah. relate to other environments and other spaces is what I always found that in deep learning is it's a bit of a question mark, right? We we have very strict 
uh, references there, but uh, take it somewhere else, and it doesn't poten it's not potentially reflected in what uh, those benchmarks uh, encompass. So anyway, I think it's very, very good, uh, very good last thought as well, actually. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, yeah, I found on the um, the article and I thought that was interesting to share. And um, yeah, so I, at least if you if you if someone did not understood anything about my presentation or, or fell asleep, this it's a good slide to finish on. I think. <laughs> All right, so any other question? I was gonna say the, the way I'm interpreting this graph is um, there's kind of like a non-linear increase in cost yep. um, compared yeah, to the exactly. error improvement. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, definitely. I think it's, uh, yeah, well, ultimately if you want a perfect network that is able to handle all case scenario, um, you, you need a, a gigantic, I mean, it's the same as a, a human being, right? Uh, so you can quantify the amount of error, um, error sorry, that a human would do. Uh, but for a human to be right all the time, we would need a very, very, very big brain and um, with lots of neurons. And to some extent, uh, deep learning is the same. So if you want a perfect response all the time, um, you, you need a very big network with lots of parameters. And I think it's just simpler to, to uh, acknowledge the fact that the prediction will never be perfect and uh, work around that in the same way as we do in robotics. And, and probably uh, with that regard, uh, having um, confidence, uh, so uncertainty about the prediction is very crucial. Uh, which which would help to make decision basically obviously. I think in, in robotics and in science in general we have the same problem as we have everywhere else in life. You know we have people <laughs> not with very big brains but actually with very big heads. <laughs> not yeah. necessarily filled up with a very big brain. Okay. Thanks very much, uh, This was excellent. All right. Thank you. So no, no other comments. All right. Uh, all right. So thank you very much for uh, to everyone for attending. And uh, and was a um, it was actually really great uh, to prepare the presentation. And uh, so I, actually during the presentation, I, I got a, a massive headache, and uh, I'm feeling terrible right now. But um, um, so I dragged my way through the presentation. Uh, but so, sorry if, uh, if the presentation quality was a little bit uh, messy. Um, but uh, uh, so just uh, as a comment for the future people that will be presenting afterwards, um, I, I think it's, um, it's, it's a really great chance for, for postdoc to be able to present. And uh, I really enjoyed uh, being able to, to share uh, what I've been learning in uh, some other fields. And uh, so I think it's a great experience, basically. So anyway, th thanks everyone for joining. And uh, I'll, uh, I'll share uh, like uh, the, the recording afterwards. And let me know if you want uh, me to share the slides. And uh, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll send you everything uh, afterwards. Yeah, I think sharing the slide will be good. Mm. Sure, 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 sure. Okay, yeah, yeah, okay. no problem. Thanks, thanks. Thank you. Thanks, thanks Rafael, thanks very much. Okay.